So without further ado, I do want to introduce our speaker for today, who will be talking to you about financial wellness and budgeting and all sorts of good things. Uh, so Kate Rogers from the U of I Credit, U of I Credit Union. Oh, we'll be speaking to you. Hi guys, how are you? So today we'll talk, we'll be talking about personal money management, and it will really occur in two parts. We'll talk about where your money goes, developing a personal spending plan, credit score one on one, which is everybody's favorite part, um, and then how to contact us if you have any questions. Feel free to stop me along the way if you do have questions and want to take a deeper dive. This is for you. And really to give you some tools to start thinking about where your money is going today and how you can set yourself up for financial success when you graduate. And my understanding is all of your internships are paid, so now is a great time to start budgeting. So the first component of budgeting is really knowing where you spend your money and knowing where it goes instead of wondering where it went at the end of the month or before the next paycheck comes. So most people spend their money on housing, food, transportation, clothing, entertainment, and then debt payments like credit cards, in your case maybe student loans, maybe you have a car loan, um, any other, anything I'm missing here that you guys as students are spending money on today. Tuition, yeah, tuition payments. So this is really where your money is going today. So the first step in budgeting is knowing where your money is going so that you can tell it where you want it to go instead of wondering where it went. Barriers to meeting financial goals. So there are many challenges um, to be able to make progress towards your financial goals. So whether that is paying off your student loan as soon as you graduate, or saving um, to purchase a car, or to purchase a home, or maybe you're here in Illinois now, but you know that when you graduate, you want to be on um, the West Coast or the East Coast, or in another country, really starting to save now so that when you graduate, you're prepared to make that move. Typical barriers are impulse buying. Who, who buys anything out of impulse? I totally do it, you guys. Amazon, like it's just asking you the next best thing, or you're standing in check, the checkout lane, or maybe you're ordering from Grubhub or Instacart or something like that, and you're like, oh, I'll go ahead and add on that drink. But those things add up. And so knowing that really gives you a little bit more control and just acknowledging that's what's happening and being mindful about where you're spending your money can make a big difference using credit cards. So if you're doing too much impulse buying, it's so easy to swipe that credit card or pull out your Apple Pay um, or whatever your digital wallet is and make that payment or that buy now button on Amazon, right? Uh, you get into having to use your credit cards if you've done too much impulse buying. And then this really, all of this kind of ties to poor spending habits. So if you don't have a budget and you're just spending really with Millie, you don't really know where it's gone at the end of the month and then potentially you're out of money or you can't meet that financial goal that you had for a savings or a down payment for a mortgage or whatever it could be later on. The other thing is financial emergencies. As students, um, what types of financial emergencies do you encounter today? Anybody have a pet? Anybody? Okay. So pets can be really expensive. I've learned that recently. Well, we learned that. We didn't have a dog for about five years, and we do now. Um, or maybe you had to go to the hospital, or you have a, a medical situation that you weren't anticipating, and then you get that bill, or you have to deal with that. So those types of financial emergencies come up. If you have a car, um, anything related to the maintenance of that car can be a financial emergency if you're not prepared for it, if you haven't had really solid spending habits and budgeting leading up to that potential financial emergency. And for the most part, all of us are going to have some kind of unexpected expense probably every three to six months at a minimum. If you look back over the last three to six months of your life, what came up that you spent money on that you weren't planning to spend money on? So let's start thinking about those things now and kind of plan for those and build a little bit of a cushion to be more prepared. So we talked a little bit about impulse spending. I think this is probably the biggest challenge for most people is the impulse spending and the poor spending habits. So really give yourself the fourth degree, whether it's, what do you guys, what is on your mind right now that you're like, I might hit the buy button? 
Anybody? Yeah. Uh, Final Fantasy game. Okay, she wants to buy the Final Fantasy game. Okay. So here's the fourth degree. Do you really need it? I don't know. Do you? You might really need it. Maybe you're making money off the Final Fantasy game. I don't know. Do you need it, right? Um, do you have to have it today? Or could it wait a week or so or a little longer after you've saved some money to purchase it uh, or reallocated your spending and not bought other things? What's going to happen if you don't buy it now, for better or worse? Um, and in some cases, thinking about when you graduate, depending on where you work, you might need a, to freshen up your work wardrobe. So what is the worst thing that's going to happen? Do you, I mean, do you really need it? You might really need it, depending on um, what that the attire is required for that position, or maybe you don't really need it. Um, again, the Final Fantasy game. I don't know what's going to happen if you don't buy it now, right? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, no, I'm asking. No, I'm, I'm asking. Okay, so that's important to you, right? Um, so that's a consideration. But maybe there's, maybe you don't have that relationship, maybe someone else doesn't have that relationship, and there's no consequence to them for waiting to make the purchase. So for you, it's more important, and maybe you would prioritize the purchase of the game over something else in your financial life. True? Sure. Yeah. So everybody's situation is different. We can't take one thing and say, this is good for everybody, or this is bad for everyone. It really depends on the situation. And then, why have I gotten along without it until now? My guess is because it was just released, right? Like it's a new version? Uh, no. Um, I've, been the, uh, I've been playing the free version, and it's getting Okay, so you've gotten along with it, out it until now because the free version was good enough, and now it's just no longer good enough, right? Um, for me, it would be like, how have I gotten along without, I don't know, this like new pair of shoes, or how have I gotten along without, like, this I don't know, piece of furniture or something like that. I mean, that, it's a little ridiculous, right? What we can become uh, fixated on to spend our money on and when we really think about if we need it, if, why we want it. Is it emotional? A lot of, most purchases are emotional. There are a lot of emotional ties to things that we buy and spend our money on. So really, the reason that you want to budget is, again, so you know where your money went. Because without a budget, you're sort of it's like operating a car without a steering wheel. You're not giving it any direction to meet the goals or to meet your end destination. So have the plan to meet your goal goals, and in doing this, minimizes anxiety on if you're going to be able to pay your bills. Uh, for you guys, even now or when you graduate, if you know where your money's always going, you don't wonder if you have enough um, to make your rent payment or make your mortgage payment or your car payment or whatever it might, might be in your own life or now. So I'm going to kind of skim through the rest of the budget portion because I know everybody probably really wants to hear about the credit score stuff. Um, that's usually where the, that's the most popular portion. So when you're building a budget, just think about your necessities first. You've got to cover your housing, food, transportation. Most people forget to budget for clothing, but you really do need to have something in a budget for clothing because, I mean, you have to wear clothes, right, out in public. So you, you need to look presentable depending on your job you're in or where you're going. So don't forget to do that. And then a lot of people, I, I hate to budget money for the extras, but I know I'm spending my money on the extras. So budget for the extras, whether it's Starbucks or um, an experience that you're looking for, or a new game or travel that you anticipate coming, budget for it now so you're not wondering how you're going to pay for it later. So the next portion is really about credit scores. Credit score 101, what you don't know can hurt you in your financial life. So credit basics, it's really how you're utilizing someone else's money to buy something now and then you're paying it back over a period of time. And there are three factors of credit. It's really your character, so how well you're honoring your financial obligations, your capacity, how easy is it for you to pay off your debt, do you have more debt payments than you have in monthly income, and then collateral. So is that loan secured by something? Examples of unsecured loans would be student loans, credit cards, maybe a personal loan for an auto repair or a medical bill. And then a secured loan would be a mortgage or a car, 
furlough, something where there's collateral that that financial institution can say, we're going to take that back if you stop paying this for it. Any questions before I move on? So what does your credit score really do? Why is it important? What it is, is it's not even for you. Did you guys know this? Credit score is not even really for you. It's for a lender to be able to have a forecast of how well you're going to pay them back over time and the risk that they are going to take by giving you that loan. So what they'll use their credit score to do is determine if they're going to give you the loan, whether it's for a mortgage um, or a car, how much they're going to make you put down towards that purchase. So if you're going to have to bring cash to the table to buy the car or to buy the house, and then how much, and then what your interest rate is, which really impacts how much you have to spend on that loan over a period of time. And your credit score is just a snapshot of your credit history at this particular moment in time. Uh, credit cards, anybody have a credit card? I'm assuming some of you guys do, or a student loan. So at any given time during the month, your credit card balance fluctuates, right? Um, or your student loan balance might fluctuate depending on if you've had to take an advance to pay tuition or if you have made a payment during that period of time. So when they take a snapshot of your credit, whatever your lender is reporting, they're reporting that moment in time, that particular day, what your credit card balance was that day, what your student loan balance was that day. So throughout the month, your credit picture is going to change slightly. So um, people get very concerned about their credit score changing 10 to 20 points throughout the month. That's sort of just normal fluctuation. And if you're using your credit card one month and maxing it out for a big purchase and then paying it off most of the other months and not using much of it, your score is going to be vastly different. And that's okay. Your credit score doesn't matter unless you're actually trying to do something at that point in time that that measurement has been taken. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So the primary model that most lenders use is some version of the FICO score. Um, and these are running through the main credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And they're based on an 850 scale. So that's really the top end when you're looking at FICO scoring models. Some lenders have developed their own scoring models, and that's all real, really proprietary. I don't know if any of you guys are working at Synchrony or Capital One, but you know that there's probably, you guys have built your own risk score also on top of the credit score. But the primary factor for your credit score is how you're paying your bills, your payment history. Are you making your payments on time? That's step one. How much is owed? So if you have a $10,000 credit card and you have a $10,000 balance, you have nothing available, 0%. If you have that same $10,000 credit card and you have $1,000 charged, you have 90% available. Your credit score could be 100 points higher just because you have so much more available. It's really showing it, what it looks like to the lender and to the credit scoring model is that you're not living beyond your means. You're not having to rely on your credit on your credit cards and you're not maybe at capacity and, and struggling. So if you have a credit card, try to keep that balance low in relation to the back, into the limit. And then length of history. We could be talking about me um, and then we could be talking about my husband right next to me and if I have had a credit card that's been around for 10 years and he's had one that's been around for five years, I have more history on that. So naturally, that's going to boost my credit score, assuming all other variables are the same. And then new credit. So if you're going out and opening multiple new credit cards, accounts, loans, um, that really impacts what your score looks like. And then over time, as you establish that payment history, um, your score really starts to level out where it is going to end up. And then your types of credit use. What, your, what does your mix look like? Somebody who only has credit cards, which is very typical, credit cards and student loans, um, when you're coming out of school, your credit score is probably going to be lower, maybe in like the 680 range, which is okay, six, maybe 720. But then once you get a little more experience and you have some secured installment mixes in your credit history, car loans, mortgages, those types of things, you begin making payments on your student loans, your score is going to naturally rise because you have a good mix of credit experience. So as I spoke earlier, when you have a better credit score, you get a better interest rate on things. 
So as you increase your credit score, you really increase your savings over time. And the golden range that you're really looking for is 740 and above, 850 is that top end. Thinking about a mortgage, because I'm get, who's going to want a mortgage on these, one of these days? Who's going to want to buy a house? Anybody? I'm guessing some people will, maybe not. I don't know, right? Um, so if you're wanting to buy a house, a mortgage lender pulls all three credit reports, and they're going to take the middle score. So if one of them is 720 and one of them is 850, and then one of them is 860, they're going to, I'm sorry, 760, they're going to take 760 as the middle score to determine your mortgage interest rate. So 740 and above, you're going to get the best rates all day long. You're pretty much always going to get approved as long as you're not trying to borrow way over your income level. Um, so that's really the golden range where you want to be. But most people coming out of school really start out in this 680 to maybe 720 range right in this class, and that's totally fine. Um, that's to be expected, so don't be surprised if that's kind of where you are today. If your score's a lot higher, great. You just need to keep it there. As an example of the savings over time, if we're looking at two different borrowers, borrower A has a much better credit score. They have an A-tier credit score, so for an auto loan, we would consider that about 720 and above. And then borrower C, borrower B has a C-tier credit score, so that's like 660-ish. Um, both are buying a $30,000 car, and their loan rate is 8% different. That's based on like our loan rate today, pretty typical of other dealer rates that are available. The monthly payment is over $100 higher, and over the life of that loan, borrower B is paying $8,600 more. So that's a pretty significant impact when you think about what you could do with an extra $100 a month, whether it is saving for something else, funding your retirement, funding an emergency fund, or paying down other debt, especially things that have higher interest rates that are compounding, potentially student loans um, or credit card debt. Any questions here? So there are three credit report, reporting bureaus, as I mentioned earlier, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. All of you can get a free credit report from annualcreditreport.com. So my challenge to you today, if you do nothing else, is to go to annualcreditreport.com and pull one of these three bureaus, and then in four months, pull the next one, and then in the other four months, pull another one. So every four months, you're getting at least one credit bureau from each credit report, so annually. And what you want to do here is you want to review it for accuracy. Here is why this is very important. The credit bureau breaches that have been happening and other breaches that have been happening have been exposing uh, consumer data at a greater rate than they had in the past. So we are beginning to see the fallout of that and seeing a lot of identity theft and fraudulent applications come through. So I want each of you guys to go out and just check the credit reports and make sure there is nothing on there that you don't recognize. So if there is an auto loan or a credit card that you know is not yours, you need to dispute it and determine if potentially there's identity theft happening. This is important now because once you graduate, you're going to have significant challenges mitigating these things later the longer they go on. So if you're pulling your credit report every four months, I don't want you pulling it to your score, unless you want your score, you can go ahead and pay for that. But the free version is really to check the accuracy of what's on your credit report. Um, this is also really important if you have a name that is very similar to your life. If you have a sibling that has a similar name, or a parent that has a similar name, especially if you're a junior or a senior, um, or like a second or a third, sometimes children's credit reports have their parents' um, loans on them. So go check those for accuracy. So when you go to annualcreditreport.com, again, you'll be able to get a copy of each of the credit reports annually, so space those out every four months, so you're always getting a fresh one. Um, if you are denied credit, you are requ you're required to receive a copy of your credit report if requested within 60 days. And again, review those uh, annually for accuracy, dispute your incorrect information. For more information on overall kind of credit report things, you can go to myfico.com. That's a really good place to start. There are multiple um, companies out there that help you, like Credit Karma, if you're interested in constant monitoring of your credit report. Um, some of your financial institutions will even post your credit, credit score, um, depending on the services they're engaging with, on your online banking, maybe on your credit card statement. So those are a good thing to get you to get a baseline established. But what 
I'm challenging you to do is go out and check to make sure there's nothing on your credit report that you don't recognize and, and deal with it now rather than when you're ready to buy something. So the things that are on your credit report will be your personal financial information, so your name, any current and previous addresses. As a student, you probably have had multiple addresses, um, apartments, potentially dorms, other places that you've been living. Just make sure you recognize them and that there's not an address that is totally out of left field that you don't recognize. If you see something like that showing up in your credit report, take a, take a deeper dive and again, verify all those accounts and verify all the data. Your credit information is really looking at um, anything that you've borrowed over the last seven years. So if it's been paid off and closed for over seven years and it's probably fallen off your credit report, it's unlikely that you guys have that situation. Any public record information, so bankruptcies and collection accounts. So what you guys should really know about this community is that some of the hospitals will bill you a couple times for the same service because they'll bill for potentially the hospital and then the physician. So make sure that you're checking your mail um, and that you're, or you're going out to your online account if you needed to have medical services because if these aren't paid, they go to collection. And they just sit out there as a public record that they've gone to collection and potentially those people will try to collect from you later, which will make it hard for you to get other things like, like, a, like a car loan or a mortgage. So just check and make sure that's out there. And you know, if you've been again to Christy or Carl, give them a call and just say, hey, do I, is there anything out there that I owe you from this one visit? I remember seeing, I remember seeing a bill, especially if you moved. Um, sometimes mail isn't always forwarded. I would say that's the biggest challenge for students in this area um, is finding these medical debts later on. Um, for you guys, probably this isn't likely, um, but IRS tax liens and child support, those things are uh, being debated in the industry today about whether they should be on there or not because the state um, and the federal level, they're really bad about updating the IRS records once taxes are paid or once child support is paid. So some of that stuff um, may continue to stay on or not. But if, if you or someone you know, more particularly like if you have a parent or someone that you know has um, that situation, have them check their credit report too. Um, a lot of times your parents don't know they can go out and pull these credit reports and check the validity of their information as well. Um, inquiries will also show you who's looked at your credit report. They're soft and hard hits, so soft hits won't always show up. Um, but hard hits should if you're applying for a loan or something like that. If you're applying to open a new account at a financial institution, they can do a soft hit um, just really for like OFAC and um, like Bank Secrecy Act checks. So that's, that's not uncommon. Those usually show up as soft hits, so you probably won't see those. Any questions along the way? So when you improve your credit score, you really increase your savings. And there are four things that are really determined by your credit score. So whether or not you're approved um, for whatever you're applying for, the interest rate that you receive, homeowners insurance and car insurance. Did you guys know that insurance companies check your credit report and they price um, your premiums based on your credit score? So in this case, because you are students and your score may be lower today, if you do have car insurance, once you graduate and you've seen your credit score rise, I would encourage you to shop your car insurance because your insurance company is not going to reprice you once your score rises. But if you go shop it, the new insurance company will give you the better pricing. Um, so keep that in mind, shop your car insurance if your credit score rises. And then another thing is employers do background checks, which include your credit score. So it could really uh, impact your potential to receive that dream job um, offer and then get to the background check. So do everything you can now to make sure your credit score looks good and your credit report is clean. So the do's and don'ts of maintaining a good credit score. Pay your bills on time. Keep your balance low in relation to your available credit. So try to spend on your card no more than 25% of your limit on a monthly basis. If there are some months that you're over, it's okay as long as you're not applying for something in that month or the month after when that bill cycles. So it's okay to spend a little more as long as you're not planning to do something that month. 
Because your score is going to change right back as soon as that balance goes down the following month. Um, so again, I can't say this enough, monitor your credit report for recent activity and for anything that is not yours. Have a good mix of credit cards and installment loans. Probably um, harder to do today than it, will, than it will be in a few years once you graduate, but those are things, again, like car loans, mortgages, credit cards, sort of mixed in. The funny thing about credit is that if you always pay cash for something, you never have a credit score. So then when you go to get a mortgage or make that first big purchase, the mortgage lender is like, you don't have any credit. I can't give you a mortgage. I don't know how you're going to pay. So start building your credit now so that you have some history when you're ready to do that later. Um, you can always work with us. We can take a look at your credit report if you have any questions. Um, in your cases, you probably don't have a lot of ability to boost your score until you're ready to start making some purchases. Um, but also, if you have a local community financial institution that you trust or a financial institution that you trust, regardless of who you're using, a lot of them will have financial services tools and um, personal money management and financial wellness tools. So reach out to them and see if they can help you take a look also. Work with really whoever you trust. So don't open accounts you don't intend to use. This is super easy if you're in a store that really great offer to save $100 on your Amazon purchase or 20% off if you're saving at the checkout. If you're really only going to use that card for that one moment in time, I would really recommend not opening that. And I would definitely not do that all the time unless you plan to use the card and keep it active. Don't close unused accounts in good standing. You heard me earlier talk about payment history. If you close accounts that have been in good standing for a period of time, you wipe out all that payment history in your score calculation. Um, and then if that's your oldest card, like if, if your very first card or loan um, was like a store or credit card or a student loan, the credit cards are the worst because once you close that, then you maybe wipe out that, that payment history. Don't request a decrease on your credit limit on your cards that is going to be lower than your highest balance ever was. So if you do this, what it looks like on your credit report is that you have spent more than your limit on your credit card. So it's okay to request a balance decrease, but make sure you're not doing that below your highest limit. So check that before you do that request. And then again, don't open a whole bunch of new accounts over a short period of time. I think I'm about out of time, and I wanted to allow about five minutes for questions. So, any questions? Yes? Um, if uh, someone does take a card, there is some uh, credit card going on, there is some uh, credit card going on, but it gets resolved, is that how long it's going to attack under credit card? So, I think you asked if your credit card was stolen, and someone used it. So, as long as the financial institution has resolved that, and transferred and coded the account appropriately will not impact your credit score negatively in the long term. Um, it would be different if a whole if a new account was opened fraudulently and it wasn't removed from this, the credit report. That's a good question. Anybody else? Uh, do you apply funds and grants to the credit Say that again. Uh, the applying funds and Oh. Okay, so the question was, do electronic funds transfers, EFTs, give you credit history? Uh, they do not. This is a really good question. I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, so here are the things that don't establish credit history that most people think establish credit history. Your phone bill does not establish credit history. Your cable bill or satellite bill, recurring payments to like Netflix, things like that, they do not establish credit history. Um, but if you don't pay them, they go to collections and they show up negatively on your credit report. So if you pay them, you don't get any benefit, but if you don't pay them, then they hurt you. That's a great question. Yeah? This is a bit of a follow-up. Certain things like Ameren charge you a fee if you use a credit card. Is the fee what? Worth it. Uh, okay, so the fee is worth it if you don't have any other money to make the payment, um, and if for some reason you have a rewards system that is earning that you're earning more on than the fee. Um, so some of this, 
So basically what's happening is that Amron is charging you a fee because they're using a third party provider to process the payment and they're in turn being charged the fee. In a similar way to if you go check out at Target, Target is paying the interchange fee. Um, so they're paying maybe like one and a half or two percent. So Target's not passing that along directly to you in a way that you're seeing, um, but they're probably passing it on to you in the price of the merchandise. Uh, whereas Amarin is passing it on directly as a fee for making the payment. There are, there are many companies that do that. Do that. It's a good question. Yeah. I'm going to walk for you. There's so much. I can't hear you. Say that again. Yeah, I wanted to ask you if I want to purchase a car right now, and I want to go to the market to see the best available trades, and uh, would it constitute a negative uh, credit score uh, if I change the market for the Okay, so the question is he wants to purchase the car right now, and if he goes and checks in multiple places for different rates, will it negatively impact the credit score? The potential is that it could, but that's only going to impact the credit score for the moment in time because of the multiple inquiries. Um, but if, I mean, if your score is like 720 and it goes to 710, it's not that big of a deal. It, you know, it's not going to move it enough that's going to throw you into this subprime type category for a car purchase. Um, I'm going to add on to that a little bit. If you're shopping for a vehicle at a dealership, um, usually they have anywhere from 10 to 20 different lenders that they can choose from to send you through to try to get you the best rate if you're not shopping on your own. And what will happen is they'll have you sign a blank application and they will send your um, application through a system usually called Dealer Track or Route 1 that will look out to those 10 or 12, 20 different lenders um, and every single one of them is going to pull a credit report for you. So if you don't want that to happen, and you want to shop on your own for your interest rate, go to the financial institutions that you're work in, interested in working with and apply with them directly. Uh, I, I did not know that this was how the dealerships ran all of that financing. So if, let's just say you're shopping for a Toyota and you go out to Napleton and you say, and you found, you, they say, oh, I'm gonna get you 1.9. You say, okay, and you fill out the application. They're gonna send it to PNC, to us, to Fifth Third, to Ally, to Toyota, um, all the different potential lenders, and all of them are going to look at your credit. So you're gonna have tons and tons of inquiries. But lenders know that's happening, so they don't they don't really look at you negatively in that way when you're doing that. Yeah. That was a that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> The question is, what is the U of I Community Credit Union? So we are a credit union that was actually founded in a janitor's closet on campus uh, in 1932. And now we have a branch right over here at First Street. We have one Lena Union, and then one on the corner of Cunningham and University of Urbana. We serve about 50,000 members. or a full-service financial institution. So savings accounts, checking accounts, um, certificates, which are like CDs. We do investments in retirement planning, mortgage, auto loans, credit cards, like anything that you would do at your normal financial institution, we can do. That's yeah. That's a good question. So does everybody know the difference between credit unions and banks? Anybody know? So banks have shareholders, um, and they have a paid board of directors who governs them. And so the profits are generally returned to, to their shareholders. Our shareholders are our members. So when you're a credit union member, um, any money that the credit union earns, because we're not for profit, we return uh, in services and products back to our members or potentially better rates on auto loans or savings products. And our board is all a volunteer board, so they're not paid. So we're cooperative. Any questions? No? Okay, well, it's 12.51. So I think I'm a minute over. <laughs> All right, if, um, there are budget worksheets in the back if you guys want a scratch worksheet to kind of get started on. I love a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, I don't know how, what you guys like to use. There are tons of budgeting tools out there like um, you need a budget now and every dollar counts. So the thing is, is a budget 
is really a tool for you, so you need to use the tool that makes the most sense for you. So if you want to sit down in front of your PC um, and walk through this massive spreadsheet, do that. If you want an app that's quickly on the go telling you what you have spent, how much money you've left to spend, do that. So the thing is it needs to work for you, um, not everybody else. So whatever allows you to tell your money where to go and to maintain your credit score is, is a tool you need to use. I, I'm not going to endorse one or the other, but there are so many out there. Um, just figure out what works. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have a good summer.